Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine 2022, sitting next to the man of the hour, big time award recipient, Dr. Kim Williams. It's so good to see you here, my friend. Thank you for having me again, and extremely humbled to get that award, the Benjamin Spock Award from Compassion and Medicine. Never would have thought that that would apply to me, but I really appreciate it. Well, as, as we sit here, you've uh, just finished uh, your presentation, and uh, at, at the dinner last night, you kind of gave a preview of what was to come this morning. Um, I was really blown away by what a lot of what it was that you were talking about. Um, but I want to start with this marketing study that you were talking about where you had a family was it your granddaughter who went in and actually logged how many hours of TV actually I never asked her how many uh, how long did it take her to watch the 104 tunnel vision commercials but she was highly successful at, at uh, logging it and then she actually did the scoring as well we did the statistics we did the writing but she was uh, a critical portion so thanks Kari <laughs> <laughs> and what was this study for the roomies who aren't yet familiar this to me was yep. mind-blowing so this was actually just looking at what food is being marketed and we labeled the paper marketing mortality because that's what it turned out to be if you look at the science of food are you eating refined grains saturated fat uh, animal protein that has cholesterol in it if you look at uh, sugar sweetened beverages if you look at what's being marketed to people there's a lot of fast food and it contains those very American styled items which result in the obesity diabetes hypertension heart attack stroke and death and so the data is very clear and the question is are we going to do anything about it uh, are we going to try to restrict it are we going to get it away from our younger people there's a lot we can do to make our advertising better and have it be instructive about how to get people to be healthy instead yeah. of increasing the amount of plaque burden that they have uh, chronic disease and death it and and the thing that you said that really struck me perhaps the most last night also was the fact that we're so heavily advertising this yet what almost four five decades ago now advertising cigarettes became illegal on TV and we know the effect that these foods are having as you just said and yet that's exactly what you see all the time you turn on a, a baseball game football game tennis match it doesn't matter across the board you're seeing coke Pepsi cereal fast food galore yep. all of that it's the majority of what you see we really have to be able to separate health uh, from wealth right that is our major issue if we if we could understand uh, the business aspects change the businesses so that they're profitable on doing things that are going to make our country healthier that would go a long way and it's not just going to be the advertising it really is going to be education and having the people demand and and purchase the things that are healthy then the businesses will sell those things what do you think the net effect would be if there was that crackdown on that type of marketing if we took all of those advertisements off of TV what do you think would happen to the trends that we're seeing for all of these chronic diseases. So one of the things that we found, uh, unfortunately, after the, the uh, paper was published, was the analysis of who's watching television. Okay. And it turns out that if the if they use five hours of television watching per day as the standard of a lot of television, it turns out that the odds of you, uh, your population, uh, watching that much television was extremely high over 35 percent if you're talking about people who are in poverty and if you're talking about people who are making a hundred hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year it's less than one percent mm. and there's a linear relationship between income and how much how many people are watching that much television so the impact is going to be that our poor people are going to be inundated less with the kinds of foods that are going to harm their health Right. And the net benefit to our society is tremendous. I know people don't like me saying it, but it's just a simple analysis of growing, growing up in, in the African-American community on the south side of Chicago. The systemic racism that has resulted in poverty, undereducation, poor health literacy, all the things that combine together to make the, our social determinants of health inequities also impoverish us in terms of our tax base. That's why our schools remain poorer. Well, what is that really, what am I really saying? Is that when we get sick, everybody else is paying for it. 
because we have one IRS, we have one tax system, and we have one Medicare system that all, every dialysis patient can get on. And so who's paying for the dialysis? Because we can't afford to pay for it ourselves. So this is a problem for all of us. We are one country. I'm not sure everybody remembers that. that that's a phenomenal point. And it, it also makes me want to talk about something else that you have spoken about here on the show previously. But again, I'm sure this morning and last night, risk, not race. Right. Genetically, pretty much a, a level playing. I mean, more or less. I mean, mm -hmm. some, some differentiation. But the color of your skin, the color of my skin almost irrelevant if we're all eating the same thing, living the same healthy lifestyle, correct? No, absolutely. Yeah, it's, <laughs> one, it's funny that you mentioned skin color. I did my little genetic thing. I'm 71% Sub-Saharan African with a little bit of an albinism gene. <laughs> you know? so, just, just a touch of albinism. Exactly. It's like, well, I mean, it's, it, 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 fortunately, I don't have a lot of it. My uncle did. Um, but the real issue is that uh, the, the genetics of all humans are so similar. And yes, there is a slight increase in a few genes, like the one for, um, uh, for the mutant um, uh, amyloid heart disease that happens to a lot of older African-American men, if African-American men can, are fortunate enough to get old. Right. Uh, we have some sickle cell. We have some, um, uh, the APOL1 gene that makes us a little more susceptible to chronic kidney disease, which means that no black people should be eating animal protein because we're taking that risk of what's going to happen to our kidneys. There are a few genetic differences, but they are minor. We're right. basically the same. Right, right. And yet, we know this. I mean, this is kind of the world that, that we operate in. We, we know the research. But then when you look at the trends, mm -hmm. it's very much alarming the direction that we're headed in. Yeah, this was actually published last week uh, or earlier this week, and I hope everybody sees it uh, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology where they projected, based on current trends, what's going to happen to the health of our population cardiovascularly. And the data is very striking. That minority population is not going to be the minority anymore. And that our white population is actually going to stay steady in terms of, of numbers, but benefit from the incredible progress we've made in treating cardiovascular disease. So their disease incidence and mortality is going to go down while it goes up in Hispanics and blacks. And that's going to drive the country actually to, to even more uh, health care costs than we have already. Uh, and it's going to be non-sustainable. And, you know, the article was very clear that we need to get ahead of this. We need to start doing more screening and, and learning about who's got what disease. I'm saying that we need to change it. We need to stop the diseases right. from happening. Right. And marketing and education, these are tools that we can use. Uh, I would love to see red, yellow, and green uh, labels in, in the stores. You, and sure, people are going to want to buy some of that red stuff, you know, the processed meat. You know, and if you're doing it once or twice a month, that's one thing. Not good for the animal it came from necessarily, but for, but not so bad if you rather than doing it every day. Make some changes that are going to be uh, really fundamental to health, and these are the kinds of things that we could do with education. I I love the the traffic light system that you're describing. I think that they they have something similar over in the UK. I was talking with Dr. Gemma Newman about that uh, last night. She said, "Yeah, you go into the grocery stores. That's how, that's how things are labeled." And to me, that makes a lot of sense. Like, it's a simple system literally anybody can understand. Red, dangerous, yellow, middle ground, green, you're all clear, right? Who can't comprehend that? The littlest of children can comprehend that. And I think that they might even take pride in, in picking those healthier choices. Like, hey, mommy, hey, daddy, I picked the green food, right? I mean, can't you envision that? That's actually been shown. It turns out that uh, there were a couple projects, one in San Francisco, and then um, the, if you remember the uh, old Obama White House uh, uh, food and nutrition uh, initiatives, I think they were in Norfolk, Virginia. Hometown. So they, they actually were going into schools and changing the snacks. Uh, to, you know, carrots and celery. And it turns out that the children could actually affect their parents wow. in terms of choices. 
And so we really have to, 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 to teach the young people and have them lead us. Shout out Norfolk, Virginia. 757 is coming through. <laughs> um, what has you excited? Uh, we only have a couple of minutes remaining here, but what has you excited for the future? We just talked about some pretty depressing statistics, right? But mm -hmm. there's always that silver lining. Where is your hope coming from today? Oh, I would say it is the young people. So a couple things. One is uh, that I talked about today. Uh, one was the fact that you're seeing every now and then you're going to get a little glimpse of better nutrition in hospitals. Why are hospitals so important? It's when people are sick. Uh, they, or they've had a heart attack, for example, and they come in and you take them to the cath lab, you open up that artery, and then you come around rounds the next morning and they're being fed bacon and eggs. Mm. That has to stop. Mm. So we've passed uh, legislation, I wish it was, <laughs> uh, from the American Medical Association, PCRM, the Washington uh, chapter of the AMA, uh, our national um, organizations got together to put in a resolution to try to make hospital food more healthy. Yeah. It was passed overwhelmingly by the American American Medical Association uh, House of Delegates. But, you know, all the American Hospital Association will look at that and say, you're not the boss of me. And, and they, take some, they have some serious issues with plant-based nutrition in hospitals. They say that it's too, a little more expensive, and that's because of our government subsidies, subsidizing the wrong things. Yeah. So it is more expensive for the hospital to give us food uh, that people will think is good for them. Well, then the, you, you have the press gainy. That is, what is the public opinion? You have to turn that opinion around yeah, yeah. Uh, so you don't judge the hospital badly for feeding you healthier food. So we have to come overcome these barriers. Well, we're starting to see it. We've seen it at University of Florida. We've seen it at uh, Albert Einstein Montefiore Hospital because there was a leader who wouldn't let it go. So I actually am happy to say that I tried real hard at Rush, and uh, it finally, as I was leaving, went into place because of one medical student, Emily Hoembeer, who actually worked for PCRM for a while, has a few publications, understands this area, and she wouldn't let it go. Get That's it what we need. We need the young people to take a hold of um, the concepts that we have uh, that are scientifically proven and then distribute them uh, and get us all to change. Amen. All right, final question. Serena Williams evolving from tennis after the U.S. Open. That's a long and storied career, my man. What kind of emotions do you have as a lifelong tennis fan? Well, I, I, I guess because I am a lifelong tennis fan, I've seen it happen so many times. The, the one person we didn't see it, you'll remember, was Pete Sampras. Why? Because he won that U.S. Open. He beat Andre Agassi, his longtime uh, uh, friend and nemesis. Uh, in the finals of the U.S. Open in 2002, walked off the court and never did it again. So we didn't get to see what we saw with Stefan Edberg and everyone. You know, Bjorn Borg had left, but so many people, you had the Jimmy Connors going out there in, in 1990 and playing this incredible tournament, getting to the semifinals at, an, at, at 40 years old. Well, what happens most of the time is the, the, the people will start to diminish the physical skills in tennis, but the mental skills get better and better. Right. And so they can play at an extremely high level. And if you look at that last match uh, in Cincinnati with Serena versus Emma Raducanu, the U.S. Open champion, this, it was the same. It was the same level of tennis for much of the first set. The, and that becomes the issue. <clears throat> when you get older, can you, can you use all of your skills, make all the shots, play at that high level, and then, yes, you can, but can you maintain it? Mm -hmm. Can you do it match after match? Can you do it for two weeks? That's where it gets really hard. Now, to connect our two conversations, you do have some people who are playing good tennis at older ages, uh, and that's because they went plant-based. So you're seeing Venus Williams, plant-based nutrition, as far as I know, she's still doing it. Uh, who's playing long beyond her expiration date. Oh, for sure. And, you know, Novak Djokovic, and, you know, you can talk about vaccines or not vaccines, but the fact of the matter is he is able to uh, stay in those matches, the rally tolerance that he has and the, the ability to focus and, and come back from two sets to love. You know he's never out of it because he's not going to get tired. That's the, that is the effect of plant-based nutrition. Man, we need a sports talk show. I mean, <laughs> like we, we, I could kill two hours just like going down this road. I love it so much. But uh, I know that you're, you're in demand. And uh, I'm just honored that you took a couple of minutes to sit down and, and join us again. And once again, congratulations on the award. So well-deserved. And congratulations also for your new role at uh, University of Louisville. Well, it really is.
is a wonderful uh, opportunity at University of Louisville. Just going there and interviewing, never thought I would leave Rush, but I have to admit, I never thought I would, would be a department chair, but when I, I listen to their passion for the people, the trying to fix the healthcare disparities on the West End, and uh, understanding that a university can really take a hold of social determinants of health and, change, and really make a change. And that could become a national model for how things could work around the country uh, using the academic leadership. Uh, and they actually embrace the ideas of, uh, of prevention. And this is a system that I feel like I could really uh, make a difference in. So I'm really happy to be there. Uh, I hope everyone can take a look at the University of Louisville website and look at the CARA, the, the cardinal anti-racism agenda that they have uh, going on. And that's going to express itself in so many aspects of our society. I'm hoping that uh, everyone will partner with us. Amen. Hey, I'm going to be keeping my eye on you. I'm expecting big things over there. No pressure. No <laughs> <Fantastic>. pressure. <laughs> Dr. Kip Williams, thank you, my friend. Thanks, Chuck. I really appreciate being here again. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.